Welcome to worship with First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, Chattanooga, Tennessee. We are commemorating Good Friday today with reflections on the seven sets of last words of Jesus before the crucifixion as recorded in the canonical Gospels. This is a tradition that is thought to go back to the 17th century, originating among Jesuits and their congregations in Peru and spreading across the entire Christian tradition. Before the emergence of social distancing practices in response to the spread of COVID-19, our choir had planned on offering musical reflections on the seven last words. As an alternative, we are offering reflections from members of the First Christian community on the seven last words. I know that you will find their unique thoughts on each of these phrases enlightening. And so friends, I invite you now to begin a time of meditation on the passion, the horror, and the mystery of this day. Grieving God, on the cross your son embraced death even as he had embraced life, faithfully and with good courage. Grant that we who have been born out of his wounded side may hold fast to our faith in him exalted and may find mercy in all times of need. Amen.
His Brother's Keeper, by Edward Scott Crossland. Around midnight, Daniel heard him tossing in his bed. Alarmed, Daniel tiptoed across the room to check on his younger brother, who always slept peacefully. But tonight was different. Feeling the cold floor beneath his feet, Daniel shuddered as he recalled the previous day's events. Daniel had seen this cruel punishment before when he and his family had traveled about the countryside. But tonight, this familiar yet harrowing scene replayed its gruesome details, leaving an indelible impression on his young memory. Daniel's brother rocked feverishly among the sweating sheets. Sam, Sam, whispered Daniel with hushed urgency. Leave him alone, get him down, yelled Sam, half asleep. Sam, I'm here, and you're okay. Wake up, little man. Gently, Daniel raised his bleary-eyed brother, and taking a glass of water from the bedside table, he urged Sam to take a drink. Somewhat recovered, Sam confessed, I'm sorry I woke you up, Dan, but I can't stop thinking about what happened to the teacher yesterday. Daniel, assuring his brother, replied, It's cool, Sam. You didn't know what you were doing. He's been on my mind, too. Sam shifted as Daniel crawled into his bed. While Sam, exhausted and comforted, drifted to sleep, Daniel thought about the first time his parents took his brother and him to hear the teacher. He couldn't forget how Sam had eaten all their food and how, incredibly, their empty lunchbox had been refilled with crackers and tuna. Daniel struggled to remember the teacher's unique sayings. While some confused him, others challenged him. Yet Daniel was in school and he wanted to play ball, not follow some nobody from nowhere that his parents had found. Then yesterday changed everything. Following breakfast, Daniel and Sam walked heavily to school. Nearing the cemetery, Daniel saw Sam veer toward the gates. Hey, bro, where are you going? asked Daniel. Can't we go look, Dan, just to see? Daniel stopped and breathed heavily. Dan, you heard Mom and Dad whispering to each other after breakfast. Something's definitely up, and if you won't go with me, I'll go alone. Rushing inside, Sam darted among the tombstones. Sam, wait! Man, this is definitely not cool. But when Daniel had caught up, Sam had stopped at the mouth of an open grave. Daniel took Samuel by the hand, and together the young brothers entered the empty tomb. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Truly, tell you today you will be with me in paradise truly i tell you today you will be with me in paradise Jesus, 
Just remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. I think I heard him say, when he was struggling up the hill, I think I heard him say, take my mother home. I think I heard him say, when they was
When he was in his 40s, the Quaker author Parker Palmer suffered two all-consuming bouts of depression, what he characterizes as the ultimate state of disconnection. Throughout these periods, Palmer found himself paralyzed by his depression, unable to leave his home, unable to overcome his sense of alienation and isolation. Many of his friends abandoned him during this time, but those that did come only exacerbated his state of depression. They offered tried advice and superficial empathy. In the midst of it all, Parker was completely and debilitatingly alone. It is that depth of sorrow, of loneliness, of forsakenness that I imagine Jesus felt as he uttered his final words upon the cross, as recorded in the Gospels of Mark and Matthew. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? By this point in his passion, Jesus had been tortured to the point that he could no longer bear his own cross, forsaken by his disciples, the Romans, the priests and scribes, even by the rebels crucified next to him. Three hours had passed since darkness had fallen over the land, as if even God, the one he had called Father, had turned away from Jesus. But Jesus' crucifixion, his final words, weren't merely an expression of what was happening to him. They were a revelation of what was happening within the Godhead itself. The crucifixion tore Creator, Christ, and Spirit asunder in grievous disconnection from each other. For God loves creation enough not only to suffer for it, but with it. In the, crea- in the crucifixion, God suffers in solidarity with us, whether we are overwhelmed by depression alone, maintaining social distance at home alone, or gasping for breath in the ICU alone. There God is too, suffering in co-passion. The theologian Jürgen Moltmann puts it this way, There is no outside the gate with God. If God himself is the one who dies outside the gate on Golgotha for those who are outside. Jesus' final words are not a balm to those who suffer because they explain away or minimize suffering, but instead because they acknowledge the depth and breadth of all human suffering and affirm that God has suffered such things too. Parker Palmer recalls just a few people who were able to minister to him during his depression. He writes, One of them was a friend named Bill, who, having asked my permission to do so, stopped by my home every afternoon, sat me down in a chair, knelt in front of me, removed my socks and shoes, and for half an hour simply massaged my feet. He found the one place in my body where I could still experience feeling. Bill rarely spoke a word. When he did, he never gave advice, but simply mirrored my condition. He would say, I can sense your struggle today, or it feels like you're getting stronger. I couldn't always respond, but his words were deeply helpful. They reassured me that I could still be seen by someone. Jesus' final words communicate that it each of our bleakest, loneliest moments, we too are seen. Among Jesus' final words, the phrase, I thirst, really does stand out so much to me. It's such a simple phrase, especially in comparison with some of the other things that he said. And they also carry so much weight to them. They're human expressions of his physical suffering. At this point, the physical exhaustion of what he had been through were starting to take their toll. I find myself being very solemn on Good Friday, in all honesty, full of anxiety, thinking about what Jesus endured that day. The words I thirst are said to be the words of distress. The word distress obviously stands out 
so much because I think that's what so many, many of us have been feeling lately. I couldn't help but notice the connection there. Although we can never understand or comprehend the pain and suffering Jesus went through, we are in uncertain times and it's hard to understand and comprehend what is going on in our world and what our future holds. The actual definition of a distress is an external, usually temporary cause of great physical or mental strain and stress. I can't help but cling to the word temporary. What brings me comfort on Good Friday when thinking about what Jesus endured is to remember that his physical pain and distress is temporary. He is close to the end and close to no longer being in pain. That brings me comfort and gives me hope. Taking that same sentiment and practicing it with what's going on in our world, it also gives me great comfort and hope. And I think it's important to remember that our distress too is temporary. I miss you all. There are angels hovering round. There are angels hovering round. There are angels, angels hovering round to the We're on
Here marks the distance between God and us. A last breath, a last hope, a last verse. Here are the hands of a God who reaches out, and we fear our hands touching one another, and we fear our hands touching our own faces. Here marks the distance between God and us. A last breath, a last chance, a last word. Here is the spirit of a man left broken on a tree, sentenced, condemned, dead, among so many like him, and yet alone. Here marks the distance between God and us. A lost breath, a lost life, a lost word. Here, toe-to-heel footprints count out the distance. Six feet from one, two thousand years from another. Lynching tree to tomb, the whole of us waiting for tomorrow. Here marks the distance between God and us. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you Sometimes it 
it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble.